Let's go first, uh, Ambassador, to the crisis in Ukraine, which has strained U.S.-Russian relations. And, of course, the chief of NATO has called Russian aggression in Ukraine the greatest challenge to Europe in a generation. We witnessed, of course, Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea and now its attempts to destabilize eastern Ukraine. Do you agree that the battle over Ukraine and Russia's aggressive posture pose one of the greatest challenges to Europe in a generation? What do you think is at stake? Absolutely. There's a great deal that's at stake here. First, it's not only the action that was taken, the illegal invasion and unlawful annexation of Ukraine, and what it does to Ukraine, the destabilization, the attempt at weakening Ukraine as it is striving to become associated with Europe and to put in place political and economic reforms. But there are other ramifications of what is at stake here that affects the globe at large. The first being, very significantly, that these actions have actually put into question the international order, international norms, international law, legal norms as we know it, because of the illegal aggression. It defies the structure of the fact that there has not been it, this kind of overt aggression that's been taken uh, on the continent. So the first is, is, is that, which uh, is very important and has ramifications for other parts of the world. But I will tell you a second that many have not focused on, mm -hmm. and that is it also undermines nonproliferation. Mm -hmm. In 1994, the United States, the UK, and Russia signed the Budapest Memorandum. And what happened there was Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Ukraine at the time had the third largest nuclear forces in the world, and it gave up its nuclear arsenal in return for respect for its territorial integrity and sovereignty. So this sends a very bad message, the message being that um, a, a, a document uh, like this undercuts proliferation, a non -prolifer, if you will, non-proliferation efforts. So other countries in Asia, in the Middle East, they're all watching these steps closely. It is of great concern. What you said is tremendously important, and that leads me to ask you then about the U.S. and European response to the aggression. Now, the United States and Europe have imposed sanctions on Russian and Ukrainian individuals who have fomented uh, destabilization and violence. Uh, Germany, however, is particularly reluctant uh, to push too hard given business interests and the fact that uh, the EU depends on Russia for about a third of its gas needs. Given these uh, factors, what more should the United States do in your view? What other tools do we have at our disposal uh, to deter uh, Russia from further aggression? Well, I think there are a number of tools that we have at our disposal, and also there have been a number of requests that have been put forward. First, let's talk about the political lane. I think it's very important that the West stands united on this issue and indicates that, uh, you know, we cannot recognize this unlawful aggression in Crimea as we go forward. Uh, other steps that may be taken uh, if they transgress and go over the line in terms of the lack of respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, I think we should be holding firm in being united, politically united. Secondly, uh, there's the economic lane. You've mentioned uh, uh, sanctions that have been put in place that are targeting uh, a select number of advisors. These are advisors who are engaged in uh, 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 kinds of uh, corrupt uh, financial actions and in which uh, these measures can and should hurt. However, there are other economic sanctions which uh, the West together can be looking at, and that is in the context of closing down and shutting down uh, markets, markets that would not be open to Russians, uh, whether they're seeking credit or seeking loans, what have you. Uh, I think that is an area that uh, has to be on the table. 
And then there is the military area. Let me put that out because you have the countries of Poland, the Baltic states, in particular, uh, Latvia has some 25, per, excuse me, 27 percent of their population are Russian, uh, ethnic Russians, 26 percent in Estonia. So uh, they want to see a kind of forward deployment of troops, NATO troops on the border to deter any further aggressive actions. I think those are also uh, options that are on the table, including the option Ukraine has solicited a military uh, training, support. It had been emasculated uh, of its military assets uh, during the time, uh, in particular more recently under Yanukovych. And so there is also another option. And finally, that needs to be looked at. And finally is the energy uh, option. Um, here, uh, this is a potent one. Uh, uh, Russia relies very heavily on its energy exports, both oil and gas. And and in this case, you know, it's understandable in the sense that Europe puts out that, look, a large portion of our energy is, you know, relying on Russia. But here's an alternative for them. And this isn't a change that has to be done overnight. But let's say they take targets, 20 percent or 30 percent, where they cut off the supplies they're getting from Russia, and in turn, look at the United States. Uh, we certainly can provide um, uh, uh, LNG, and we should be doing that. That is a very viable option. I want to get into that uh, in a moment about the United States perhaps stepping up its uh, export of liquefied natural, mm -hmm. natural, ga natural gas. But let me step back one more time and take a look at the impact of this crisis on U.S.-Russian relations, which mm -hmm. were presumably reset. We were in a cooperative mode to some extent under the Obama administration, whether on Iran, North Korea, uh, Syria, a number of issues. Um, what do you think Vladimir Putin wants in Ukraine? I mean, we know that Ukraine is very important to Russia's identity. Uh, it sort of straddles the East and the West. Um, what do you think he's looking to do? Uh, and uh, how will this affect U.S.-Russian relations on a number of issues for which Russia's cooperation is, is quite important? For example, you know, as I said, Iran, Syria, North Korea, and many others. Well, on the first, what is it that he is seeking? He is certainly seeking, and he's even said it himself directly, uh, he is seeking a, an establishment of a Eurasian Union, and that Eurasian Union would bring together, as he sees it, uh, countries that he would like to have uh, embracing uh, values, uh, values that are not the values of the West. Here, I think what the challenge is and the issue is with regard to Ukraine, he is seeking to force a situation on Ukraine, which it, it doesn't exist. And that is that Ukraine has been a united country. There have been no secessionist movements since its independence. And in fact, uh, Ukrainian ethnic uh, Ukrainians have been living peaceably together with ethnic Russians and Russian speaking Ukrainians and Russian speaking Russians all together have been peace of, peaceably, you know, existing in Ukraine. These current situations uh, that we have 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 surfaced uh, have been um, uh, triggered, uh, have been provocations. And uh, here you had demonstrations that took place last year and even up to the present, which underscored two core considerations that Ukrainians want. First, they said they want an association with the European Union. They wanted the association with the European not only because of the ties, the political, the values, but also because of the economic opportunities. This would have to bring about economic reforms. And most significantly, and it's the second reason for these demonstrations, was the fact that you have um, uh, leaders who are corrupt in Ukraine, in Russia, and the strong desire to change that to change that and to ensure that instead what you will have is a clean and functioning uh, government. So what you have is uh, uh, Putin trying to put Ukraine in a situation which doesn't exist. I think that the people of Ukraine uh, should be uh, able to put together 
uh, their program and in a way that has united the country and I'm sure will continue to the unite, unite the country prior to these provocations. Ambassador Dobryansky, do you think that uh, Vladimir Putin is creating a pretext for additional military action by covertly fueling unrest in eastern Ukraine? And when the U.S. warns of consequences, a high price to pay, what do you think that means uh, concretely? What is the United States and the West willing to do if Russia continues this destabilization? Well, I think one has to be gravely concerned when you have troops that are amassed at the border, and then you have these provocations uh, taking place internally, which have been protested against by Ukraine, Ukraine, the Ukrainian government. And then you look at the countries, the neighbors in the region, who are also very concerned and watching these actions very, very closely. So one can only surmise what would happen. I do think it's quite important at this time that the West show a very strong, uh, united, and, and uh, very targeted uh, uh, response, uh, and strong response to these actions. And in particular, I think, uh, going back to these military options, Poland, the Baltic countries have made an appeal. They put a concrete appeal forward to NATO when NATO met and they said, we need to have these assets. We need to have an on-the-ground deterrent. I know that um, uh, some actions have been taken, but more cri critically needs to be done. And there's a second aspect that we cannot forget, and that is during this time, all of these actions have really uh, targeted a weak Ukraine. And Ukraine is trying to shore itself up. So also, that's another area the United States, Europe, must be vigilant in providing the kind of assistance that is being solicited here. You know, some analysts are talking about echoes of a Cold War, again, despite the lack of an ideological dimension and the fact that there are no nuclear weapons trained uh, on each other that is between the United States and Russia. How do you see this analogy? Well, I, I, I think that uh, we clearly are witnessing uh, a, a uh, serious kind of tension. I do think that uh, uh, if uh, Russia opts to pursue these aggressive goals further, uh, I think that uh, all experts will come to the conclusion that this is uh, uh, a revival of the Cold War. But let me also add something here that I think is important. The term Cold War has been used. But I think we need to be very vigilant to the fact that uh, Putin ha is redefining the international order. He has targeted the international order as it has existed, uh, the kind of norms, legal norms, that have been respected by all countries. And this is of grave concern. It's of grave concern because it does send messages to others in other parts of the globe that there isn't a respect for legal norms. There isn't a respect for international law. And we know that there are all kinds of disputes that are playing out in other parts of the world. So what the United States and the West does here matters greatly, not just only for this region, but as a signal to others as well.